And welcome to Divorce Hacker. I'm your host, Dan Grant. On this show, we'll have a variety of guests who've been through divorce and are experts on the topic. Whether you're thinking about a divorce, in the midst of it, or already divorced, we are here to share our stories with you in the hope that you may relate, learn, process, and overcome whatever you're experiencing in your life. Tom Sturgis is an icon in the music industry. He served as president of Chrysalis Music and head of creative for Universal Music Publishing Group. He has been an active Grammy member for over 30 years. He's also authored five books and is a regular guest speaker and educator. Tom is a professor at UCLA and the father of three boys living in Los Angeles. When Tom and his first wife found themselves divorcing, he decided to make it a good divorce, and he did just that. He literally cracked the code to such an extent that his current wife and his ex actually go to Soul Cycle together. Tom has actually now written a book about it called A Good Divorce Begins Here, A Guide to Surviving and Thriving Afterwards. Tom's book has been a guide for many and is even used as a textbook for a divorce coaching program that specializes in amicable breakups. I am so excited to have Tom on our show today and talk about how to have a good divorce. Welcome. Welcome. What a great intro and thank you so much. I am so happy to have you here, Tom. Um, You and I both have been divorced and unlike me, who made a lot of mistakes during the process and did not have a good divorce, you cracked the code even before you did it. Talk to us about how you did that. Um, What I wanted to do more than anything else was stay a part of that family group. I had many friends where it was suddenly it was her friends and his friends. And uh, I loved her family, uh, the Armados, well-known family from down here. Her brother was my doctor. Her other brother was my lawyer. Her mom was my real estate agent. And it was a beautiful family. Most of my family had passed away by that time, so I was right. It was, this was my group. So I just didn't want to be married anymore. I wanted everything else. I just didn't want to be married. And that was what I set out to do, was to withdraw only from the marriage, but not from all the other relationships. So my ex and I have stayed the closest of friends. We talk most mornings, uh, which is very interesting. And some, for some reason, she calls me her best girlfriend, which I'm... It's odd, but I, you know what? I go with it. Uh, so uh, it's turned into a really, really fantastic uh, friendship over the years and a relationship that will be with me for the rest of my life. It's remarkable, and it's an unusual story, sadly. Mm-hmm. So I want to delve into a little bit more of the specifics about what was going through your mind when you decided mm-hmm. you no longer wanted to be married, about how you would make this a good divorce, because... As an attorney who represents a lot of couples going through this process, sadly, often they don't end up as, you know, being best friends or with the husband being the best girlfriend. <laughs> so I, uh, what formed in my mind, and I'm a, I'm a giver, so possibly this is what really wrote the script for me. Um, I realized I wanted to continue to give. I was going to continue to be in her life. I had discovered my ex-wife and given her her first deal in the music business, welcomed her in, fell in love with her mind long before I fell in love with the the person and everything else. Um, So I had three main ideas I wanted to follow through my divorce. Kindness, respect, and generosity were my three basic, and I just, those were part of every uh, every interaction and every conversation were those three things in mind. So as a rule with my children and my, both my wives now, I never raise my voice. So there's 
my rule is that if you get upset, you whisper. So if you go up on Ashley over there and you go, I am so upset with you right now, it changes everything because you're showing her complete respect by whispering, but you are not, you are still getting your message across that you're not happy. And so with my ex, as we were into that transition, we're, we're getting out of a marriage and getting into whatever's next, and boy, what an uncertain future that is. With kindness as this overarching uh, premise for our uh, relationship, there was no raised voices, no name calling, no accusations. There's nothing to accuse her of. It was just, hey, we're not going to be married anymore. Now what? Um, the respect came in the form of the fact that we were both professionals in the same business. I don't want to diminish her standing or her reputation or anything else. So it was all very quiet and respectful. And then the generosity part was where I think a lot of people lose their minds. Uh, and I play golf with a guy who has to write his ex a check the first of every month for the rest of his life. And uh, that... I, I did not want so we can talk about it later but I figured out how to do it all on one in one day and have the whole thing be completely wrapped up so I want to follow up with you about the writing one check um, mm. I was in a similar situation and knew that if I had to write a check every month uh, I was going to be a very bitter woman and my number one goal in getting divorced was to not be bitter mm. So talk to me about what specifically you did to be done after writing one check, because I think this is really good advice for the breadwinner in particular, um, rather than wanting to be, what's that saying, um, penny smart but pound mm. foolish, mm. and the repercussions associated with that. So actually, uh, the check got written to me is how I did this. So on one side of a piece of paper, it was all my financial obligations looking forward to the next 20 years. Uh, spousal support, uh, child support, uh, kids going to college. And that was all on this side of the page. On the asset side of the page uh, was basically just the house. And I had bought the house very early. It had gotten to be much more valuable. I didn't want any of her songwriting money or her producing money. I didn't, that was her money. So I was like, you know what, as part of my generosity program, I'm going to make plenty of money. I'm still working. So you don't have to get a check from ASCAP and then go, oh, I've got to write jerk a check. Um, so I wanted nothing that was hers and solely hers. So the ledger is all the obligations. Let's say it's a million bucks, right? And the value of the house was about three and a half million, right? And Either way, the million and my share were very close. Close enough so that I said, you don't have to write me the check right now, but at some point you're going to have to give me 250 grand, which turned out to be two years later when I finally found a new house to buy. And I went back and I said, okay, I'm ready. I need this for my down payment. And it all worked out perfectly. So um, that was a, a big part of it. And so she, I quit claim the house to her. So... Suddenly she was a homeowner. I was not suddenly. So for the first time in you know 20 years, I didn't own a property. But she did, and my boys lived there and had grown up in that house. And the idea of like selling that house so we each get a piece, I was like, oh, that's that doesn't get in with my kindness, respect, and generosity. That's the opposite of those. The other thing I did, which I think goes into that same category, is who has the right to the kids? right? Uh, that whole, which is, I understand, one of the bitterest arguments that the couples have. And I said to my wife, I'll tell you what, I will give you 100% custody without any strings attached and no, no anger whatsoever in exchange for 100% visitation. So I don't want to come over Tuesday at 4.30 and return them Friday at 9 a.m. I want to be able to come over and keep coaching, drive them to school. If you guys are on a trip, I want to be able to come over and make breakfast. I don't want any, uh, I don't want any complications of that. And they can live with you. It's fine. Live, home is where the mommy is anyway. It's not going to be in my new apartment. 
Do you know what I mean? With a, with a couple of, you know, those daisy posters. And th- that is not home. Home is where you grew up, where you've always spent y- your time together. And I would always call first and, you know, and knock softly, but that's how it worked out. So for the rest of their childhood, they got to be in the house they always loved and lived in with their mom. So It's brilliant. You accomplished what often takes years to get to. Um, when people are not approaching their divorce with the level of kindness and generosity and also pragmatism. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, just, I want to reflect back your comment about, you know, home's going to be where their mom is and you didn't force, you know, if I'm given what you've shared with us, I suspect she wanted to stay in the family home with the kids Absolutely. and it was a very wise choice or decision that you made in terms of how to approach this that probably gained you a lot of like, it was a deposit in the bank account of goodwill. Mm. Um, and then also the way you approached custody was brilliant because oftentimes what will happen is people will spend a lot of money, um, and a lot of acrimony is created by going to court a bench officer makes decisions in 15 minutes. They don't know anything about you or your kids. Um, that Then you have to follow those orders um, to the T or you're held in contempt. And the only uh, thing that typically comes out of that is the children you know, get churned up in the process. And what people forget, uh, they walk out of court, they feel like they've won, but kids change. So let's say you have certain orders that, you know, appear to be pragmatic and applicable when your children are seven and 11. Well, before you know it, you know, they're no longer in grade school. They're in middle school and high school. And whatever the schedule was that was set within almost a nanosecond is no longer going to work because now they need to be at a little league or They don't want to come to your house because they're having a friend over. So the way you approach this, I actually kind of did something very similar Mm. on the visitation end of things. We were headed to trial and I wasn't a family law lawyer at the time, Mm. but I contacted my husband and said, let's just let the kids decide, Mm. Um, which is not always the right thing to do, but in our situation it was, and it took all the pressure off of us kind of like you did. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where you end up anyway, once they're preteens and teenagers. And even the law reflects that, you know, by the time they're 14, they can decide where they want to go because often they're bigger than we are. And it's not like you can strap them into a car seat. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I think what you did was you just had tremendous foresight and probably saved a bundle in attorney's fees. Am I right? Uh, we never hired attorneys. Uh, a friend of mine served as our attorney once we agreed on everything and wrote up the paperwork. And we finalized everything at the Daily Grill over a glass of wine and a gin martini with him sitting right between us. Amazing. Yeah. So, and I don't know if this, how this factors in, but um, I know what I was able to do was to let my relationship with my wife change. There's two parts to this. The, I don't think a divorce is ever even, it's, a, it's never 50-50. It's always gonna be, well, you, it's, it's never 50-50. Somebody has to be willing to make a sacrifice and, uh, and take one for the gipper if that's not too ancient a reference for somebody as young as you are. So I had to let the relationship change because it wasn't just, hey, we're divorced, hey, we're, now what? I had an eye on now what mm-hmm. and what that meant. And I knew she was going to fall in love with somebody because she's very passionate, Italian, just the love. And I knew that if I got lucky, I, I might fall in love again too. So uh, what I allowed our relationship to become was it, we went from writer and publisher to dating and quiet to uh, affianced, to married, to parents, to divorced friends. And then what naturally was the next step in this garden between us was brother and sister. I love this. So this is what we became after 
all those other steps is I rooted for her. Have another hit. So she ends up writing uh, I Love You Like a Love Song for Selena Gomez, which has nothing to do with me. I don't make any money. I have nothing. I'm just on the sidelines with my pom-poms and my, uh, you know, that, my yell funnel going, yeah, Your beautiful. Megaphone. Go. And it, it was my, my megaphone. It was, she was like my sister, my kid sister. So she could call me if there was an issue when she ultimately did fall in love. Um, and uh, she could call me and say, okay. So he just did this. What is my, what does that mean? And why do you guys do stuff like that? And I want them to be together. I want them to be happy. I want them, uh, as a matter of fact, at their wedding, I was the only person at the wedding. It was a very private ceremony at their house. And it was all her mother and her kids and me to wow. give you how, an idea of how close Amazing. we became. Yeah, and stay are and still are. We I, could call her now. <laughs> I love this idea of reconceptualizing your relationship. Perfect word. As she was your kid sister. Yeah. Because who would know each other better than a husband and wife? And how wonderful that you could be her biggest cheerleader mm -hmm. and her big brother. Yeah. Because having been through divorce and ha having represented so many women going through divorce, I think honestly it's a very frightening situation. We hand over a lot of often financial responsibility. Mm -hmm. In particular, if we're raising children, you know, that I see this all the time. I did it too. Like, well, I'm busy with the kids and my career. Like, I'm expecting you're handling the finances and this and that. And so often we find our, not always, but often we can find ourselves feeling really overwhelmed by the financial piece of things. Also, having the kids all the time mm. and not having help, uh, all the things. Right. And I'm sure that men experience similar, but maybe different emotions. Um, so to have someone that knows you better than anyone on the planet on your team, as opposed to what often happens is your worst enemy mm. trying to destroy you and win in court. Mm. Um, what, it, this is like a game changer. I mean, it really is evolutionary. And, you know, now we have, we can see the effects of that in that you're both living very successful and happy lives. You went on to uh, find a new love, get married, have more children. You talk in your book about how you had a life-threatening health emergency and your ex's brother, who's a doctor, saved your life. You talk about how when it did come time to get a new home um, with your new wife that uh, your ex's mother helped you, who's a realtor, helped you find your new home. She I mean, was the one who was like, why don't you look at that one? And then uh, we bought a short sale at the end of the last right. housing crisis. Uh, and she was the one who handled everything. And it's two blocks from uh, my old house, uh, my old castle. It's uh, two blocks right there, so my boys can run down. Like if I'm watching the football game, I'm like, "Are you guys watching this? Get down here!" And now that everybody's old enough to drink, I can I can be shaking the martinis as they're on the way down. Here we go, here we go, go Chiefs or go Raiders or go whatever. So it's it's just it's almost like a compound because she lives uh, the house I bought for her that first house was right next to her parents. Wow. So. The, that the woman I her mom is like one of my one of my dearest pals I love her mom we do all kind we bring her down to the house if we're having Super Bowl parties I mean she's still and this blows people's minds when I go oh, you know what I'm hanging out with my ex-mother-in-law so I can't go tonight and they're like what I mean most people don't even want to hang with the mother-in-law ever because she's whatever happened but then the ex-mother-in-law, like you have an excuse not to hang out with her and you're hanging out with her. I'm like, she's, well, she's a love. She's a Songs love. have been written about not having to hang out with <laughs> a mother, your future ex-mother-in-law. That's right. That's um, perfect. So she's, she's one of my pals too. This is just mind boggling to me. So we have to talk about the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is often I encounter men going through a divorce who do not seem to understand the importance of not flaunting their new girlfriend. Mm. And mm. in my experience, when that happens, 
it's like throwing gas on a fire. You know, and if you want to hand over hundreds of thousands of dollars to a divorce lawyer, uh, there's no better way to do that <laughs> than to have your new girlfriend posting mm. pictures of the two of you in exotic locations all over the world um, on social media so that, you know, your, um, your former wife who you haven't divorced yet can, and your children can see that. Obviously, mm. you didn't do that, but can you talk about that? It's just such a prevalent problem, and I so, men seem to not sometimes not understand why that's such a bad idea. It's so cringy. It's such an F you to your ex and your old life. And frankly, I think it's a lot easier for a guy to find a new person in his life, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'm not saying that women younger than the divorced husband have no standards, but it's it's easy for them, right? You, you know, roll up with some 25 year old. She doesn't know about the history, the past, anything. She's just, you know, a chance to spend time and have fun. Um, I think I'm not, obviously I'm not a woman. I have no idea. I think. At the point of divorce for a woman, it is much more terrifying to be, if you'll excuse the expression, back on the market and available, and you have to doll up and get your hair done. You never know when you're going to meet. It's there's a lot more, many, many more challenges to the ma, to the wife, I believe, than to the husband. Just the nature of things, um, and especially if it's a woman with kids, these are this is you walk into that next relationship, you go okay divorced, got a couple of kids, and I'm not looking for any bullshit. And 97% of the guys are going to, you know, hit the tarmac and just be on their way. Except, so I think you have to be aware of that. Under my premise of kindness, respect, and generosity, you have to respect the fact that you were married, right? That was 10 years of your life. That was all those vacations and probably burying a few people you didn't want to bury. But this was your partner for all that time. And you have to respect the partnership that you establish with that person. And to throw a new, uh, a, a new face and a new body and younger and different hair and, and she's going to be nice to the kids. Oh, God, it's it's... It's such a slap in the face, right? Such a slap yeah. in the face. I recommend nothing. If you're going to do something like that, keep it to yourself. It's nobody's business but you. Um, and at the very least, wait until the start of the next calendar year. Oh, I like so that. Just, there's, how about this as a defining line? Hey, we're going into, and if you happen to get a divorce in February, you just got to keep your mouth shut for 10 months, okay? Just chill because it's not respectful to... This woman who was, you're, you're everything, right? I mean, this started with vacations and, and too many drinks with little umbrellas in them and staying up too late. And, and then you had babies together. And then, oh, my God, you, 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 you just can't. It's just not respectful to your own past to be dismissive of it, right? And just go, no, nah, I don't care about all that. You went to, let's say you went to Harvard. Are you just going to take all your crimson socks and throw them out the window? No, you're Harvard forever. Uh, you become a Dodger fan. You're a Dodger forever. You were married to this woman for decades. You are hers forever on some level. And just because you got a new girl, so what? Like we care? No. Show respect to the woman who was part of your life allow her to move forward with her life at the same pace that you're moving forward with yours. That's such good advice. It's the right thing and the smart thing to do. Talk to me about the fellow in England oh. <laughs> who lost a castle. The worst, I, I thought I had some bad divorce stories, but when I read about this one in your book, my jaw was on the ground. Tell, mm. tell us about this cautionary tale. So obviously no names um, for obviously reasons, but this was a very successful uh, British businessman who uh, was flying high and had bought a castle with his winnings and paid for the whole thing. And it was just, it was architectural masterpiece and everybody uh, wanted to see it. And things, as things happened, he fell in love with his much younger secretary. 
um, and started having an affair with her. The affair blossoms. He decides to have a divorce. He gives his wife the castle as part of the divorce. All So far, so good, other than the fact that you should not fall in love with your secretary or the babysitter. Never, ever, ever, but that's another book. Uh, maybe that'll be our book. Uh, that, that would be a bestseller. Not the babysitter. Ixney. She wants your wife's job, so don't go there. Um, so he gives his wife the house and buys himself like a little three-bedroom condo almost in the shadow of the castle so he can stay close. He wants to keep visiting the kids and everything else. At any rate, as things happen, the wife falls in love. The person she falls in love with is basically a homeless musician who has nothing but his guitars and his dirty laundry. And he moves in. And they are there, and it's kind of awkward. The husband still has a key and everything else, and uh, ex-husband. And then, um, terrible thing, the wife slips on the stairs and clunks her head and uh, goes into a coma from which she never recovers. Because she and the boyfriend had established residency and she had died without a will, under the terms of British law at the time, he was the inheritor of the house. So the husband, after she passes in the, the, you know, the ceremony for her funeral, he goes up to the house and he puts his key in the lock and the locks have been changed. And he's like banging on the door and the musician opens the door. He says, can I help you? And the husband says, yeah, you can get out of my house. And the guy goes, it's my house now. My castle. It's my castle. Wow. During the period of the new relationship, the guy had, he didn't have quite enough money to hire a team of lawyers and get the guy thrown out of there. The girlfriend had moved out and found, oh, I remember what happened. The girlfriend ended up with the musician in the castle. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like they can't. Uh, that is actually the worst divorce the story in the worst history of the world. Of ever, so he now has his crappy little condo in the shadow of his castle where his ex girlfriend is living with the homeless with musician. With a homeless musician and in his, his dirty kids are laundry. In the, castle? the kids stay, they, he can visit the kids. Oh, this is just terrible. Terrible. So, okay. Lots of lessons. So, so many, so many, I don't even know where to start. Um, wow. <laughs> the, be, so how, how about um, do everything you can to stay married? Yes, right? yes. Right? Respect your wife throughout every moment of this thing. If you want to be generous, that's fine, but don't be stupid generous. Right, 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 right. Don't be stupid. Generous is good. Stupid generous is idiocy. And he felt so bad about what he had done to his own relationship and yeah. the woman and everything else that he thought he could throw a castle at her and it would all be better. And it that fell is in on him. Wild. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> okay. Let's talk for a moment about how you feel about the situation where it's a loveless marriage. Oh. And the couple has decided to stay together for the sake of the kids. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. First of all, I love that we're going to uh, we're edging into children because in almost every sentence that we've discussed, we've used the term and talked about the children because it's all about the kids yeah. to me. Ultimately, there's a whole chapter and uh, and a big part of my life now is the is based on the fact that I have a remarkably good relationship with all three of my sons and one of the reasons the older two still love me is because I never said a bad word about their mom I looked out for them at every moment uh, there was nothing they couldn't tell me there was nothing they couldn't say to me right and there was any question what do you want to know how do you what 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 happened okay this is probably what happened but here's what happened in keeping them in in the a bubble of love between me and my ex that they could never that never popped it was mm. always there for them amazing so circling back um uh i think children are brilliant amazing and whether they can put into context the experiences that they are having they are having them 
right? And if mommy and daddy are not loving each other, they can tell. Yeah. They can, they will know instantly, like they don't kiss or they don't hold hands or, you know, daddy's sleeping downstairs. And I mean, all the things that go with it. I think it's healthier for everybody. Just look each other in the eye and say, hey, I used to love you. And it used to be the greatest thing that ever happened. That's not happening anymore. I think for the sake of my heart and my future and your heart and your future and our children and the life that they're going to lead, I think we should find a, a way to, to move into our next relationships. I agree completely. I think, you know, there were studies, well, there was a study that came out in the 70s that suggested children of a divorcing couple mm. were broken. And that line of reasoning carried through for over a decade and really caused a lot of people to think they absolutely had to stay married to one another for the sake of the kids. But within the last couple of years, new studies have come out actually showing the opposite, that children of the situation you described, sort of that cold and contemptuous situation Mm. where the parents are sleeping in different parts of the house, which, you know, I sort of have the inside track on what's happening around here. And this is happening a lot. Mm. Um, is it because of economics? I think so. Mm. Um, but the kids really suffer in those situations just as they would in a situation where there's a lot of screaming and yelling. So, so what's been shown is that children do much better in the situation you described Mm. and in the kind of paradigm you set up Mm. where I think your words were you created this bubble of love. Mm. We need to really be having this discussion and talking about this so people understand that's an option. Mm. It doesn't have to be the nuclear option of, you know, we're getting a divorce. So it's just, you know, it's like a game of who's going to win and we're going to give our our money to the lawyers. I mean, this could put me out of business and that's fine Mm. because the whole reason I started doing this was to come up with a better solution for our children. And I feel like you've cracked the code on this. Well, that could be, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that could be a whole part of a beautiful business is not only will I help you get a divorce, I'll help you get a good divorce because I'm not just going to hit him with uh, here's your, let's see what you've done with your checkbook and let's see what this is and we're gonna right. break open your computer. You go, you know what, I want, bo- and bring both of them in and say, hey, I want you both happy at the That's end of this. That's what we do. It's called collaborative oh, divorce. Fantastic. So in Great collaborative idea. divorce, we basically sit with our clients at a conference room table and work out creative solutions, mm. very similar to what you did. Mm. I mean, you essentially did that without knowing that mm. with your friend who's a lawyer. Um, he was it, at the tail end. He yeah. had, it was me well, and you, her. You, you kind of did that. But the goal is to create this safe container. Mm. And in my experience, the couples that I've worked with in the collaborative process are by, by and far my happiest divorced clients mm. because we could preserve to the extent possible uh, the peace within the relationship so that you know they could still get together for the holidays like I know you do with your ex um, because there was none of that like fighting and acrimony and bad blood created Um, and we work out solutions like you described where um, you know, if children are school aged, they can stay in the family home with one of the parents so they're not disrupted. And then at an appropriate time, um, if necessary, the home could be sold, liquidity can be released so that the other person can then buy a new home or, or whatever, you know, whatever makes the most sense. But to try to maintain as much of the status quo of, of love and respect and kindness. Um, and not sort of the zero sum, you know, wanting to win. Hmm. Yeah, the scorched earth divorce. Yeah, it's a bad like a, idea. Bad book. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad, bad Do everything idea. you can to make sure your wife is unhappy and broke. And yeah. I told a story about one guy, uh, 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 this fabulous musician who had a team of lawyers and he just reduced his wife to next to nothing. Um, and I was in a conversation with the son. Right. And... Th- 
And he was saying that the divorce was just so unfair because the dad, rich, successful, powerful, had a ton of lawyers. He, she had nothing. She yeah. had like somebody she went to school with. And this, and she was, so she ends up in an apartment. He has a beautiful house. She does, never has enough money. The kid only wants to be at his dad's house because it's plush and games and videos and like that warehouse. And then, uh, uh, and the mom has got like a little apartment on Olvera Street. It's like, what? This is, and so the kids don't want to go there. So he was screwing his wife over 20 years after the divorce and he had plenty of money. It would have been so easy to just go, hey, let me set you up here. You gave me this beautiful child. I actually spoke to somebody the other day and uh, he was saying that the, his marriage was the worst thing that had ever happened to him. And I was like, wow. I said, did you have children? He said, yeah, two kids. I love my kids. But I, the kids are great. The kids are fantastic. But the wife, oh. I was like, well, uh, and I mean, at, at that point, I didn't want to say anything more to the guy because it was so idiotic. But the idea that the woman that you're saying those bad things about gave you those kids that you're saying all those good things about. Yeah. How do you unlogic that with somebody who's convinced? And I tell a story of, I met a guy on the beach while I was writing this book and I, he's, I've got my, my little boys with me and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm working on a book about how to have a good divorce. And he goes, oh, I wish my father had read that book. And I said, so why, what happened with your dad? He said, 30 years after the divorce, he still won't say her name. Mm. He refers to her as that woman. I hear that a lot. Won't go to the Christmas, won't go to the Thanksgiving, will stand on the opposite side of the soccer field. And I'm like, oh my God, can you be more of an assholic than that? <laughs> good word. <laughs> it's a good word. I mean, it's... I like that word. But it's a real word, you know. We'll find out. Uh, <laughs> but if you get yourself into that rut... Same way you can have a rut of religion where you just believe what you believe in nothing else or racism where you believe that people who don't look like you uh, don't deserve your time or, or kindness. You can get yourself into all kind of ruts. That's true. Right? And this particular guy with that woman, that woman gave you that son who gave you those three grandchildren. The short-sightedness and collateral damage to children in these situations is generational and and really and truly this is just such important work such an important message and it's really a paradigm shift in how to look at ending a relationship which quite frankly you know the statistics show that half of first marriages end in divorce about 63 percent of second marriages end in divorce no. and about 79 percent of third marriages end in divorce so you know, it's not an anomaly. Wow. It's actually, as you point out in your book, it's like being in Vegas and putting all your money on red. So we need to be realistic about this. Divorce should not be a dirty word. It shouldn't be a taboo topic. And we really need to have a discussion as we're having today and, and help people understand that there's a better way, particularly since we're all living longer. And it's likely that those statistics probably are not going to be moving in the downward direction. Mm. Um, it's, you know, the statistics show that for people over 50, gray divorces or silver divorces, um, those numbers are exponentially increasing, mm. um, especially when, once children are launched. And I think people realize they, you know, they have a new lease on life and maybe they look at their partner and decide, you know, this, I don't want to be with you for the rest of my life. So it's just so, so important given the impact it has on our children and how it's passed down that we look at this, I think, in the way that, that you did and the example that you set. So I really appreciate you coming on today to talk with me and to be able to share this with others. And I hope that you know, everybody gets Tom's book, A Good Divorce Begins Here, A Guide to Surviving and Thriving Afterward and that we can continue this discussion. Thank you so, so much. A pleasure to be here and talk about this vital topic. Mm -hmm.